Those who use the term cultural diversity to promote a multiplicity of segregated ethnic enclaves are doing an enormous harm to the people in those enclaves. Mr. President, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, my topic for tonight is cultural diversity, a worldview. Diversity has become one of the most often used words of our time, and one seldom defined. Diversity is invoked in discussions of almost everything, from employment policy to curriculum policy to entertainment to politics. Nor is the word merely a description of the long known fact that the American population is made up of many races, people from many countries and many cultural backgrounds. All that was well known long before the word diversity became an insistent part of our vocabulary, an invocation, an imperative, or a bludgeon in ideological conflicts. The very motto of the country, e pluribus unum, recognizes the diversity of the American people. For generations, this diversity has been celebrated, whether in comedies like A.B.'s Irish Rose, which I don't think I'll have to explain to some people, but perhaps to others, the famous play about the Jewish boy and the Irish girl, or in patriotic speeches on the 4th of July. Yet one senses something very different in today's crusades for diversity. Certainly not a patriotic celebration of America, and often a sweeping criticism of the United States or even a condemnation of Western civilization as a whole. At the very least, we need to separate the issue of the general importance of cultural diversity, not only in the United States, but in the world at large, from the more specific, more parochial, and more ideological agendas which have become associated with that word in recent years. I would like to talk about the worldwide importance of cultural diversity. Over centuries of human history, before returning to the narrower issues of our time. The entire history of the human race, the rise of man from the caves, has been marked by transfers of cultural advances from one group to another and from one civilization to another. Paper and printing, for example, are today vital parts of Western civilization. But they both originated in China, centuries before they made their way to Europe. Mathematical concepts have likewise migrated from one culture to another, trigonometry from ancient Greece, ancient Egypt, I'm sorry, and the whole numbering system now used throughout the world, which originated among the Hindus of India, though Europeans call this system Arabic numerals because it was the Arabs who were the intermediaries through which these numbers reached medi medieval Europe. Indeed, much of the philosophy of ancient Greece first reached Western Europe in Arabic translations, which were then retranslated into Latin or into the vernacular languages of Western Europe. Much that became part of the culture of Western civilization originated outside that civilization, often in the Middle East or Asia. The game of chess came from India, gunpowder from China, and various mathematical concepts from the Islamic world, for example. The conquest of Spain in the 8th century AD made Spain a, a center for the diffusion into Western Europe of the more advanced knowledge of the Mediterranean world and of the Orient in astronomy, medicine, optics, and geometry. The later rise of Western civilization to world preeminence in science and technology built upon these foundations. And then the science and technology of European civilization began to spread around the world, not only to European offshoot societies such as the United States or Australia, but also to non-European cultures, of which Japan is perhaps the most striking example. The historic sharing of cultural advances until they became the common inheritance of the human race 
implied much more than cultural diversity. It implied that some cultural features were not only different from others, but better than others. The very fact that people, all people, whether Europeans, Asians, Africans, or others, have repeatedly chosen to abandon some feature of their own culture in order to replace it with something from another culture implies that the replacement served their purposes more effectively. Arabic numerals are not simply different from Roman numerals, they are better than Roman numerals. This is shown by their replacing Roman numerals in many countries whose own cultures derive from Rome, as well as in other countries whose respective numbering systems were likewise superseded by so-called Arabic numerals. It is virtually impossible today to conceive of how the different distances in astronomy or the complexities of higher mathematics could be expressed in Roman numerals. Merely to express the year of American independence requires more than twice as many Roman numerals as Arabic numerals. Moreover, Roman numerals offer more opportunities for errors as the same digit may be either added or subtracted depending upon its place in the sequence. Roman numerals are good for numbering kings or Super Bowls, <laughs> but they cannot match the efficiency of Arabic numerals in most mathematical operations. And that is, after all, why we have numbers at all. Cultural features do not exist merely as badges of identity to which we have some emotional attachment. They exist to meet the necessities and forward the purposes of human life. They exist, when, when they are surpassed by features of other cultures, they tend to fall by the wayside or to survive only as marginal curiosities like Roman numerals today. Not only concepts, information, products, and technologies are transferred from one culture to another. The natural produce of the earth does the same. Malaysia is the world's leading grower of rubber trees, but those trees are indigenous to Brazil. Most of the rice grown in Africa today originated in Asia, and its tobacco originated in the Western Hemisphere. Even a great wheat exporting nation like Argentina once imported wheat, which was not an indigenous crop to that country. Cultural diversity, viewed internationally and historically, is not a static picture of differentness, but a dynamic picture of competition in which what serves human purposes more effectively survives, while what does not tends to decline or disappear. Manuscript scrolls once preserved the precious records, knowledge, and thought of European or Middle Eastern cultures. But once paper and printing from China became known in those cultures, books were clearly far faster and cheaper to produce and drove scrolls virtually into extinction. Books are not simply different from scrolls, they are better than scrolls. The point that some cultural features are better than others must be insisted upon today because so many among the intelligentsia either evade or deny this plain reality. The intelligentsia use words like perceptions and values as they argue in effect that it's all a matter of how you choose to look at it. Although diversity is used in so many different ways, in so many different contexts, that it seems to mean all things to all people, there are a few themes which appear again and again. One of these broad themes is that diversity implies organized efforts at the preservation of cultural differences, perhaps governmental efforts, perhaps governmental subsidies to various programs run by the advocates of diversity. This approach raises questions as to what the purpose of culture is. If what is important about culture is that they are emotionally symbolic, then this particular version of cultural diversity might make some sense. But cultures exist even in isolated societies where there are no other cultures around, where there is no one else and nothing else from which to be different. Cultures exist to serve the vital, practical, 
requirements of human life, to structure a society so as to perpetuate the species, to pass on the hard-earned knowledge and experience of generations past and centuries past to the young and inexperienced, in order to spare the next generation the costly and dangerous process of learning everything all over again from scratch through trial and error, including fatal errors. Cultures exist so that people can know how to get food and put a roof over their head, how to cure the sick, how to cope with death, how to get along with the living. Cultures are not bumper stickers. They are living, changing ways of doing all the things that have to be done in life. Every culture discards over time the things which no longer do the job or which don't do the job as well as things borrowed from other cultures. Each individual does this, consciously or not, on a day-to-day -day basis. Languages take words from other languages, so that Spanish as spoken in Spain includes words taken from Arabic, and Spanish as spoken in Argentina has Italian words taken from the large Italian immigrant population there. People eat, people eat Kentucky Fried Chicken in Singapore and stay at Hilton Hotels in Cairo. This is not what some of the ad advocates of diversity have in mind. They seem to want to preserve cultures in their purity, almost like butterflies in amber. Decisions about change, if any, seem to be, seem to be regarded as collective decisions, political decisions. But that is not how any cultures have arrived where they are today. Individuals have decided for themselves how much of the old they wish to retain, how much of the new they found useful in their own lives. In this way, cultures have enriched each other in all the great civilizations of the world. Those who use the term cultural diversity to promote a multiplicity of segregated ethnic enclaves are doing an enormous harm to the people in those enclaves. However they live socially, the people in those enclaves are going to have to compete economically with others for a livelihood. Even if they were not disadvantaged before, they would be very disadvantaged if their competitors from the general population are free to tap the knowledge, the skills, the analytical techniques which Western civilization has drawn from all the other civilizations of the world, while those in the enclaves are restricted to what exists in the subculture immediately around them. We need also to recognize that many great thinkers of the past, whether in medicine or philosophy, science or economics, labored not simply to advance whatever particular group they happened to come from, but to advance the human race. Their legacies, whether cures for deadly diseases or dramatic increases in crop yields to fight the scourge of hunger, belong to all people. And all people need to claim that legacy, not seal themselves off in a dead end of tribalism or an emotional orgy of cultural vanity. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Remember to subscribe. If you liked the video, be sure to leave a comment and hit that like button. If you didn't like it, please explain why. Open discussion is the only way to have a better understanding of differing views. Sharing this video on social media can help keep conversations alive. Now here are a few other videos that you may be interested in.